Well, I want to say welcome to everybody and thank you for joining us tonight on uh, Living Supernaturally with David and Friends. And tonight, uh, the only friend that's here is me and the Holy Spirit. Amen. But uh, we're going to make a dynamic duo tonight and trust you're going to be blessed, refreshed, encouraged as uh, we dig into the Word of God and continue on uh, the walk of love and in the inward witnesses, which I'm calling this series. And really, they didn't intend this to be a series, but it was so much on my heart a couple weeks ago uh, as I've just been so excited about this, uh, what I'm calling a new dimension of love. And it's hard, hard to imagine that, you know, you can be around the, the kingdom of God like all of us have for a long time, but myself, uh, 38, 30, 30, going on 39 years, and all that time have never experienced a dimension of love like I did a year ago in Germany, and then, uh, then experienced it even more so when I was back in Germany in December and did a conference there, and then bringing uh, Pastor Greg Violi to Milwaukee. Wow, what an experience, and so many great testimonies. But I've, I've said, and I've been saying, uh, since I came back from Germany in uh, December, that I really believe this, uh, this message of love, and one of the things I'm really confident of is this message of love as it would be. Uh, it's it's uh, something God is saying to the body of Christ. And uh, I really believe that um, God really opened it up to Pastor Greg in Germany probably years ago, but as we look at uh, something you've heard me talk about is the 11 year cycles, how going back to 1948 when the healing revival started, when Israel became a nation, and then every 11 years, 11 years later after 1948, 11 years, 1959, the Jesus Movement started, 11 years later, uh, the Charismatic Revival started, 11 years later, I think it was the Word of Faith Movement got started, then the, the Prophetic Movement, and then the Apostolic Movement, all these different uh, moves of God, and this is not my, uh, my area of expertise, I actually pulled this off of uh, an email, prophecy letter of sort, from Doug Addison that came out a year ago, January. And uh, he talked about this 11-year cycle. In 2005 was the last 11-year cycle. And uh, that entire year, the entire year, I was in revival. Every week, just about, might have been a couple weeks off. Started in Milford, Connecticut, 17 weeks. And then Milton, Wisconsin for eight weeks. And then Rockford, Illinois for another about 12 weeks or more. And uh, the whole thing ended at the end of one year. And according to Doug Addison, everywhere in the world where, God, where people were in revival in 2005, it ended at, the, at one year, and primarily because of envy, strife, and, and, and jealousy. And that's exactly what happened in, the, in my experience in 2005. Well, anyway, 2016, a year ago, was exactly the next time for the cycle. So when I read that last January, Literally every uh, everywhere I went is this it is this is this you know what I'm going to experience similar to 2005 and it was really quite a disappointing year I mean it was a good year but it wasn't uh, I kept looking for this 11 year revival and it didn't happen all year long and then when I was in Germany just before Christmas. I, I, I uh, experienced this incredible dimension of love that I actually started seeing it uh, nine months, ten months earlier uh, in February of, of 2016. But it wasn't until just over about a month ago, a month and a half ago, that I recognized that which I was looking for in the 11-year cycle did happen in Germany. I was anticipating it in, you know, in my meetings per se, and I didn't see it anywhere in my meetings per se, except that in 2016, in December, I saw the greatest outpouring of the Spirit I've ever seen, one, in this dimension of love, but then secondly, three different times an outpouring of the Holy Spirit with drunkenness and laughter beyond anything, honestly, I've ever seen in my entire life. And I've been around a lot of uh, 
you know, laughter, hilarity, drunkenness, if you will, back in the late 80s and early 90s. And uh, well, I saw that in Germany, but I didn't recognize what was happening is this is the 11 year revival. And it's all about love. And I would venture to say this, and I'm hearing it more and more. I, I, I don't watch television, and, and I don't, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in tune, per se, with what other people are, are preaching and doing. But what, what I'm hearing snippets here, a little here, a little there. But what I'm hearing more and more people speak about love. And my guess is you're going to hear a lot more of it. But going back about uh, to January, when I came back from Germany, I started preaching this, this, this thought right here, that this uh, message of love or the experience that come with it, that I've been calling a new dimension of love, of course it's not new, it's very old, a couple thousand years old, as we see it in 1 Corinthians 13. And we're going to go there tonight as we pick up from where we left off in our last message. But... Uh, what I, what I'm recognizing is, or what I've said about this is, I really believe this message of love, this dimension and experience, tangible presence, if you will, of love, is the missing link uh, to the faith message, and which is what I'm most acclimated to. You know, I, I try to you know visit per se all the different streams because they're all valuable. So often people get stuck in one stream. But I'm, I'm very much in, uh, in tune to the prophetic stream, to the apostolic stream, to the, uh, the bridal chamber stream, the vineyard movement. And, and every stream has something to offer. And uh, so I believe, like in the garden, there's many streams. Well, I think in the kingdom of God, there's many streams as well. And sometimes people get stuck into one of these streams and never benefit from all of them. And I, and I believe to all of the streams, per se, this dimension of love is, is what's been missing. Now here, I'm saying all this to say this, I just came back from two weeks of meetings, basically 10 days, 12 days of meetings in uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and, and uh, a little bit in Delaware, in the Baltimore area, but primarily, more so, in all the, most of the meetings were in the Pennsylvania area. But here's what I'm recognizing, if this message of love is, as I'm confident it is, for me at least, the missing link to uh, the kingdom of God, when you add the ingredient, like baking a cake, you know, if you're if you're missing one ingredient, the cake is somewhat of a flop. And <laughs> I can remember when I was a child making a, a chocolate cake, and my my mom was so kind, and you know, the the I forgot to put the baking powder or something like that in it, and the brownies or cake that I made were about a quarter inch high, and the, she you know just pacified me. Oh, and this is really good. It was terrible, <laughs> but when you're missing an ingredient, the the fullness isn't there. Well. As much as we've seen a lot of uh, miraculous demonstrations of the glory, if you will, and, and the presence of God, and as the Bible says, if you don't have love, what do you have? You have nothing. But what I'm seeing is when you add the missing ingredient, the missing link, as I say, you're going to have more fullness. And that's exactly what I've been seeing in the meetings of late. And I know I've only scratched the surface of this uh, new dimension of love, understanding it, but I have uh, had the privilege of uh, spending a lot of time with Pastor Greg Violi, which has been at it a long time, and I probably, you know, probably have heard 40 hours at least one-on-one -on -one in his meetings with him with all that we did and the time that was here and the TV shoots and so forth, and I, I know I haven't arrived, but I have really made a good step of a progress, if you will, on the journey. And I'm, I'm watching it manifest in the presence of God in meetings. And as I said in an email last week, uh, you know, uh, when you're doing a meeting, it's not about people falling over. I've always said this, uh, you know, it's not about falling over. If anything, it's about getting up. But what I've seen of recent is such a, a greater manifestation of the presence of God more people are falling over and it, it isn't like something we plan for or prepare for but uh, you know I always say to people uh, when they say well why do they fall over well my simple explanation is they can't stand up 
But the reality is throughout the Word of God, when the presence of God is present, like when they dedicated the temple, the none of the priests could stand. Or like when Jesus in the garden, uh, they said, are, are you Jesus? And he used the name he didn't use. He said, I am. Well, when he called on the I am, I mean, literally at that moment, deity showed up. And when, the, when God showed up with the I am, when he said I am, what happened? All the soldiers fell over. Why? The presence of God was manifest. Same thing with the Apostle Paul. When he was on the road to Damascus and Jesus appeared to him, what happened? He fell to the ground. Why? The presence of God. Well, you know, that's what happens when the presence of God is present. You have a, a supernatural uh, manifestation of the glory, and in that glory, I mean, people can't stand. And that's what I'm seeing in the meetings more than I have, and tremendous uh, accuracy, and, I mean, real key uh, words of wisdom, words of knowledge. And one particular night, as an example, uh, I knew there was somebody that had a neck pain, and God said to me, that, and no one came forward, and God said to me, the person was in a car accident and hurt their neck in the car accident 10 years ago. And sure enough, a person, and that's exactly what happened. And they were miraculously healed. And, and But, the, you know, the presence of God has just been so tangible. And this is almost embarrassing to admit this, but uh, I've never been so wiped out. Uh, after a meeting, it's like my brain is like not fried but it, it, it's like uh, my computation skills were gone and uh, I was working at the uh, the book table and uh, people some people bought you know uh, a few things like half a dozen different things one person bought half my bought way about three hundred dollars of stuff and I tallied his order four times and each time I got a different number so uh, this isn't right so I got my calculator out and uh, I did it on my calculator and gave him the total. Saw him four days later and he said, David, you short shanked yourself $85 or $84 because <laughs> you put the wrong number down. And I used the calculator. But the, the, my mental faculties just weren't there. The presence of God was so strong. And I know that doesn't sound like a positive thing, you know, but it, it, uh, the, what is positive is the, the people's lives that were so powerfully changed and the meetings got extended one day then another day then another day and could have easily kept them going but uh, I had things to do pastor had things to do and and it wasn't like we had an overwhelming let's keep this thing going but I am going back there in a couple of months to Pennsylvania and we'll continue on with what God is doing there but I'm so confident of this that it's not unique to uh, any person, any ministry, it's what God is doing. And it's what God wants to do for you, what He wants to do in your marriage, in your home, in your business, in your ministry, everything you put your hand to, He wants to bring it to a new level, a greater dimension of His presence. And uh, it's a supernatural wisdom, supernatural knowledge. You know, it comes to my mind as Ecclesi Ecclesiastes 2, 26, where it says to him that's good or pleasing in the sight of God, he gives knowledge and wisdom and joy. Praise God. And of course, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen. But supernatural wisdom, supernatural knowledge, and, and supernatural joy. Who, is, who, who gets that? Well, he says to him that is good. But it goes on to say to him that's not good, he gives the job of gathering up for him that is good. Now, I've been using that verse for many, many years as we teach business people around the world about the, the scripture in, in Proverbs where it says, the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. And as I sought God on that many years ago, uh, how do we get it? And God showed me diff many different aspects, but one of them is how he was using business people in supernatural ways because they, they were in a place where they can make unlimited income by sales commissions and by profits. But I've recognized he's not limited to that either. You know, I think of one couple down in Dallas that had a heart to be good. And what's good? Well, him that is good and pleasing in the sight of God is someone that wants what he wants. And what does he want more than anything? To see the kingdom of God established on earth as it is in heaven, and that people don't go to hell, they go to heaven. So when that's your heart, 
He's going to give you this supernatural wisdom, supernatural knowledge, and supernatural joy. And as I was teaching on this, and they were in my discipleship program, they began praying for that. And this is the, the, uh, the concept, too, of we're going to do what Jesus did and even greater. Well, one of the things that Jesus did when he needed money, he told Peter to go catch a fish. And uh, there, sure enough, when he caught a fish, looked in the mouth, and there was a gold coin. Now, the idea with this miracle, like all miracles, it isn't about going fishing, it isn't about a gold coin, it's about God's ability to supernaturally provide, amen? To supernaturally show you where to find a treasure. Now, sometimes you're going to go on a treasure journey and not even know you're going on a treasure journey, but he will be supernaturally leading you, guiding you, directing you, and that's part of what we're going to be talking about, continuing to pick up on, and that is on the inward witness because, you know, in order to go on these supernatural journeys to find the right fish and the right brook or whatever, you have to have a witness. You have to know what God is saying. So that's, you know, that's the series that we're on. And uh, as I prayed about this or been thinking about this and, you know, how to walk this out, God really began to show me a couple weeks ago, and that's where we started the series, the importance of the inward witness, being in tune to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And then what's very important is walking it out. Whatever he says, the very first miracle that Jesus did, turning water to wine. Well, there we see the first two keys and the five keys to the supernatural. Number one, sensitivity. What is he saying? And then whatever he says, do it. Well, this particular couple down in Dallas, uh, they were uh, desiring uh, some extra money because they wanted to do good. They wanted to have some extra money, it was right, like three weeks before Christmas, but they didn't want it for themselves. They wanted it for the kingdom, for the ministry. So they had an unction to go to the mall. They went to the mall in, the, and, uh, in Dallas, and there, as they were just walking around, they weren't there shopping, they were just there why? Because they had a prompting. They had an inward witness to go to the mall. So there they are. They're walking around the mall, and they caught sight of a, something sparkly on the ground, walked over to it, and uh, thought it was garland or something, you know, being Christmas time, and they picked it up. Well, it was a bracelet, and uh, it looked like a, a genuine bracelet, but, uh, you know, you never know, costume jewelry. So they thought, well, let's take it to the jewelry store in, and uh, right here in the mall and ask the jeweler, if this is something significant. Well, they did. And the jeweler raised his eyes and brows and said, where'd you find this? And I told him on the floor. And they said, is it valuable? And he said, well, I, I, I would guess it's worth somewhere around $40,000. And they said, wow. And, he, and they said, well, we're going to turn it into the, uh, you know, to lost and found. And the guy that in the mall there said, I wouldn't do that because it'll disappear by morning. But what you do want to do is report it that you found the bracelet of value and if anybody can identify it you'll be happy to give it to them well no one ever claimed it so they had a forty thousand treasure to uh, advance the kingdom of god praise god and and you know i can tell you many more of these stories because that's what god does and so he's not limited to you being in business or you know being in a place where you have a commission that can be increased uh, because you're, you're, you know, you're, you're in a place of business. You know, I, I do believe that uh, God is using business people in a very, very special way to help them make exceptional amounts of money. That's why we do a seminar we call Business Breakthrough. And uh, you can, if you're interested, you can order that series, Business Breakthrough, through our store. I've been doing that seminar actually for over 20 years now. But uh, the foundation principles, I don't teach business. Now, we are teaching business the hell around the world, and we're teaching uh, on exponential organizations and how to do business, you know, in a modern 21st century way and, and be successful. Uh, matter of fact, uh, three different nations right now that we're being uh, prepared to take this to at the presidential level. And uh, as I'm saying that, uh, that, that connection has been made to us through a very interesting man of significance, Dr. Clyde Rivers. He has an organization called I Change Nations. 
and uh, he's working on an initiative which is part of a UN outreach called the uh, Interfaith Initiative, but they were, they're establishing April 5th as a international day, get this, of golden rule. Do unto others as you want them to do unto you. Of course, that's a scripture from Matthew. And uh, anyway, the point is God's using him to go into heads of nations around the world and help establish this. And in the process, he has the opportunity to witness and he has the opportunity uh, to bring in uh, you know, different resources. And I'm one of the resources that he's bringing in. So uh, we're actually going to be setting up ministry training centers for, for the heads of nations and entrepreneurs. Never would have imagined God would have done such a thing to fulfill the vision of over 100 million people saved, discipled, and serving him. But God's doing it. Now, here's what's really exciting. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be going to uh, Gary, Indiana, where I'm receiving uh, this prestigious award from that nine people around the world are being given called the Civility Award. Uh, the governor of Indiana has, has uh, signed the legislation to make uh, a Civility Day. Anyway, so Dr. Rivers is actually the keynote speaker, so we're going there, and I'm one of nine people that are going to receive this International Civility Award. And then on, two, on Saturday, uh, Friday, uh, we're doing a TV shoot for the Christ Family Network um, with Dr. Rivers. And I said, hey, Dr. Rivers, as long as you're in Chicago, how about coming to Milwaukee? So anyway, all that said, uh, my next meeting in Milwaukee is April 14th. It's a Friday night, Good Friday. And then April 15th, the day we all know so well, but uh, Dr. Rivers is going to be our guest speaker in Milwaukee, April 14th and 15th. So uh, this will be a great meeting for you, and uh, I know you'll be really, really blessed in hearing Dr. Rivers speak, uh, quite a treasure. Well, all that said is, see, God gives wisdom, supernatural wisdom, supernatural knowledge to those that are good. And those, pe those are the people that want to see the kingdom of God established, in my opinion, anyway, many other facets to being good. But bottom line, God's will is no man go to hell. Amen. So what better way to be good in his sight than have a heart for the kingdom of God? Well, as I've been looking at this, uh, one more quick, I'm a quick announcement as I'm teaching here, but one other announcement I want to make to you is that as I've been praying about this, God's really showing me a number of things that he wants me to teach on hearing the voice of God and the and developing the concept of the inward witness along with the five keys to the supernatural. So we're going to be in this series for a bit. But there's no one I know better qualified and uh, is able to teach on this subject of hearing the voice of God than Dr. Mark Verkler. If you don't know who he is, he, uh, he's got a university, he's written like 50 books, I forget the name of his university, I think it's Christian Leadership University. Uh, Sid Roth has five professors of the supernatural, which I'm one of. Dr. Mark Verkler is one of, as well. And Dr. Mark Verkler was featured on the cover of Charisma Magazine a couple years ago. But all that said, Dr. Verkler will be my guest next Tuesday night. So um, be sure to uh, invite some other people. It's going to be a great presentation. He's going to be Skyping in uh, from his home and their office, I should say. And uh, so we'll have a video of him and he's going to be teaching you principles and precepts how to hear the voice of God. We had him as a guest probably two and a half years ago. And uh, it was just one of the greatest uh, shows we've ever had. Uh, the CDs are in our library at this point. You can get them online. But uh, next week, you're going to have the opportunity to hear him live right here. Now, as I'm praying about this, I mean, I'm, I'm confident of this. For this, walk in the spirit, walk in the supernatural. Again, this new dimension of love. A couple key things that are really important. Number one is what does his word say? And this is what Pastor Greg Violi has been bringing out to us in his understanding of uh, this dimension of love that is being poured out in a very supernatural way in Germany, but it's what he calls the ancient way. And when we look at the ancient way, there's many facets to it and principles and precepts, but bottom line, God is love, amen? 
And uh, so we need to walk in who He is. And when you have Christ in you, you have love in you, you have Almighty in you, and He wants to show Himself as Almighty God. But we we have to die to ourselves. And it's a message you've heard me say many, many times. We have to purpose to be humble. The third key, and what God gave me in the five keys to the supernatural. Number one, sensitivity. Number two, obedience. Number three, humility. Number four, knowledge. And that's what we're doing right here. We're bringing knowledge to you. And the Bible says that grace and peace are multiplied through knowledge. And then number five, motivation. Why do you want to experience this outpouring and the supernatural thing that God's doing right now? What's the motivation? And the motivation of heaven is compassion. Compassion, the awareness of the suffering of another and a willingness to do something about it. And I trust that's motivating you right now uh, for your spouse, for your children, for your parents, for your co-workers, for your, for your boss or your employees, for church members. As I mentioned in our last show, that I'm recognizing how uh, much I, I have loved, but at a surface level, and how I have forgiven, but I've forgiven at a surface level. And we, we have to go deeper, and that's what God's doing. He's taking us to a deeper level where we can walk in a greater manifestation of His presence. Amen? So, this is where we're going to be camping out for a while. And I'm going to tonight, to, we'll see how far we get. But one of the things God has put in my heart is cover the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, that the first seven verses really actually is probably more like verses uh, 2 or 3 or 4. 4 to 7, I guess, is our key verses. Uh, the first three verses tell us, us how uh, insignificant comparatively the signs, wonders, and miracles are and how important it is that we walk in love. So let's start there. I have a, I have a document I'm going to bring up on my screen here. And uh, we're going to go through this. Let me downsize that. And what I've done is I have put together a collection, as it would be, of a couple of different uh, translations that uh, we're going to read. And uh, so I'm going to start with my, more than my, I say my favorite translation, and it is my favorite translation, but I do have a more favorite translation, which we're going to see here in a minute, which is the Wiest translation. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Wiest did, never did the whole Bible. He only did uh, certain portions uh, of the Bible. So I can't use it as a Bible Bible because the whole Bible isn't there. But fortunately, he did uh, translate uh, 1 Corinthians 13. So we're going to read that version uh, along with a couple modern versions, the New Living Translation, the Message Bible. Then we'll wrap this, uh, this reading up with the Amplified Bible. But I want you to do more than as I'm reading this, than just yes, yes, yes. But I want you to put yourself, I believe God wants you to put you into the picture. And, you know, recognizing this is what love is, and this is what God is requiring of us. This is what he wants us to be. This is what uh, our relationships look like. Again, whether it's a spouse, a child, a parent, a co-worker, a neighbor, a family member. And, you know, we probably all have a family member or more, uh, or two in-law or in-laws that might be. And then, yeah, oh boy, they really need help. Well, I'm sure they do. And uh, as I'm thinking about that, uh, I, I saw a couple days ago the movie The Shack. And I know it's getting blasted theologically, and I understand it. I mean, <laughs> from a theological, doctrinal place, the movie has a lot of flaws. But uh, so did the movie The Matrix. As a matter of fact, somebody called today and asked uh, about the movie The Matrix and what series I have that I talk about The Matrix, and I, I don't remember. It's too long ago. But The Matrix is one of my absolute favorite movies. But if you look at it from a theological perspective, pretty bad uh, because it's not, 
you know, it's not meant to be a theological movie, even though it's got a great allegory to it. But to me, even though you have all the biblical characters there and, and uh, you know, uh, playing different parts, even though it's very violent as well as an R-rated movie. But what I liked about The Matrix is the unlimited potential. That's right. Unlimited potential. Neil, who is one of the main characters, plays a part of the Messiah, but he comes to realize that nothing is impossible. And we you know whether it's flying or stopping a bullet or whatever, nothing is impossible. And that's what Jesus said to us. And that's what you and I need to really understand. Nothing is impossible. Get that in your heart. Nothing is impossible. Something God spoke to me many, many years ago as I started really pursuing the faith and the supernatural as it would be. And, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of like, wow, God, yes, moving mountains, and yes, and walking on water, and all the supernatural. And God said to me, very seriously, he said to me, the only barrier, the only limitation you will ever come up against is the one you define. So, as I talk about putting your hand up and stopping a speeding bullet, or walking through a wall, or walking on water or doing anything. I mean, flying is cool, but translating is better. You know, if you say, well, that's kind of far out there, David, well, you just defined a barrier. You just gave yourself a limitation that will forever limit you because you think it's beyond God's ability. And I tell you, nothing is beyond God's ability, absolutely nothing. And he lives and abides in you. But as we're going to see as we read these scriptures on love, it doesn't matter how much you you have the, the supernatural ability, you know, to do anything, you know, without love you have nothing. And the, the movie The Shack, again, it's really messed up theologically, uh, you know, people playing the part of God, playing the part of Jesus, playing the part of the Holy Spirit, playing the part of wisdom, <laughs> a lot of things that, uh, you know, people can argue and, uh, I understand, are arguing big time on Facebook and stuff like that. But I love the movie. Matter of fact, I just bought the book. So I want to read the book and see how much different the book is from the movie. But here, he, he, you know, this, this isn't a spoiler. We haven't seen the movie. But this, this is a key aspect to the, the importance of the message is love. And the particular uh, actor as a young boy was brutally beat up. And I've read enough in the book that the, the movie didn't even do justice to the reality of how he was tied to a tree and, and, and beat unconscious by a drunk father who would also beat his mother unconscious. And, and when he tried to intervene, his, his father just would beat him. And then when he, you know, in a, in a youth a re revival or something like that, he told uh, his heart about he wanted to help his mom and his father found out. and. Sent his, sent his wife away for a couple of days and for two days brutally beat this young boy of 13. Well, the young boy ran away from home, and again, this isn't a spoiler, it's in the movie, right in the, in the beginning of the movie. It's part of the foreword in the book, actually. But he actually uh, runs away from home, but not before poisoning his father's uh, liquor bottles, and his father dies. And so now he's in a uh, uh, circumstance of, of being in the presence of God, and he's, been, he's put into a seat of judgment. And essentially, he judged his father for being a mean man. And the, again, I'm not going to get too much into the movie, but the idea is who are we to judge right from wrong. We can judge the behavior. The behavior was wrong, but you and I don't know what happened in that person's life or, or, or their DNA, you know, like any terrorist. You know, the ter what, the, what the terrorists do is, is terrible, but God loves the terrorist. God still loves them. He died for them as he died for you and I. And to love a terrorist, a terrorist or to love a father, that brutally beats you doesn't make sense to the natural mind. 
But this is what God wants us to do, to love the unlovely, forgive the unforgivable, turn the extra cheek. Now, he'll never want you to be a doormat. He doesn't want you to be a stepping stone. He doesn't want you to be abused. But we have to love the person, even though in our mind they don't deserve it. We don't condone uh, the behavior but we love the person and uh, that's what was so powerful in the movie of the shack is this person whew, whew. don't know if you can feel this where you are but it's wrong here the presence of god's love and i'm sure it's just because we're glorifying God in this. We're glorifying His heart. Because this is what it's all about. Loving. Unconditional love. Purposing to refuse to be judgmental. Because you know what? The moment you and I judge, according to the Bible, we put ourselves in the same boat, the same category as the person that's doing the wickedness. Because he who judges is guilty of the same offense. Amen. Well, I just trust this this, <laughs> this anointing is flowing. I'm, I'm confident to this. I always hear about it later. That, whoa, well, yeah, there, but it really hit. It did. And it's strong. And I, I just, I, I, I just, I'm asking God right now, Father, let it flow. Let this love, Father, minister in power and might to every person whether they're watching this live or by video recording or even audio recording father let this message of love penetrate let it reach into the deepest regions of our heart you know as we're hearing the spirit right now there are many 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 of you right now watching whether it's live or again by recording but you've been offended you've been hurt you've been abused maybe you've been taken advantage of and, and bad things and, and like myself you've forgiven at a surface level god is reaching so deep right now and he has been and, and this is this is going to be your key and my key to establishing heaven on earth. You know, Jesus' prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven is love, full of love, full of all, all good things, and everyone is loved. Of course, I know there's no terrorists there, but, you know, the only way many of these bad people are going to see Jesus or experience Jesus is through you or through me in our purposeful decision to love the unlovely for his glory all right well let's I want to read some of these verses here tonight I, I have uh, four pages of uh, notes if you will uh, in, in my heart I'm not and print any out but uh, lots of bases we want to cover in this series but let's let's read this. Um, it's on my screen. I'm reading from a New American Standard Bible, and uh, we're going to start reading all the verses up to verse seven in each of these translations. But uh, subsequent translations, we'll just pick it up in verse number uh, four. But from New American Standard, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, and I know all mysteries, and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Now here's the key part, and this is what God really impressed upon me for tonight to... Uh, the right word to emphasize this is what God is this is what love is and this is what you and I are called to be this is uh, an area 
of obedience. And last week, as we started the series, you know, I, I mentioned to you, God's going to lead us by His Spirit and by His Word. You know, by the Spirit, many, many different ways He can lead us, by the inward witness, by the inward voice, prophetically, by dream, by vision, personal visitation, signs, wonders, different ways God can lead us, all supernatural, some spectacular, but nothing is more uh, perfect and uh, can't be twisted per se. The Bible says the devil himself can transform himself into an angel of light. So many times we can you know, be, we could be deceived by a, a lying prophet. We talked about that last week. I'm actually gonna, we're gonna revisit that in my notes in First First the Kings 13, where you know. Um, a young prophet died because of a lying prophet, a prophet that was an old seasoned prophet, but he lied. So we can't trust the spectacular directives that are given to us supernaturally uh, by signs, wonders, prophet, uh, dreams, visions, but we can trust the word. And here, as we're reading the word, of, as Peter says, a more sure word of prophecy, this is what God is asking, I'm going to go beyond that, requiring of you and I. This is something, you know these verses, but tonight and as we go forward, these verses, you need to make a decision in your heart. This is me. This is my walk in the Spirit. This is what I do uh, all day long. I walk in love. This is me. This is Christ. God is love. But Christ in me, so I am going to let him um, work through me because I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, so I'm going to live by the Spirit. Amen. So, you know, as we read this, love is, put your name in there. David is patient. Your name is, love is. This is you. This is your manifest. This is your your calling per se even far above whatever else god may call you to do prophetically miraculously you know changing the world this is the most important part of your walk and what does it look like this is what you look like love is patient love is kind it's not jealous love does not brag and is not arrogant does not act unbecomingly it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Amen. Well, let's move along and look at it from the Amplified Bible. And it says, If I can speak in the tongues of men and even of angels, and I, I told you I was going to skip over the first verses, but I thought I had Amplified Bible at the end, and obviously I don't. So I want to read the, uh, the intro, per se, the first four verses from the Amplified Bible. And uh, so again, If I can speak in the tongues of men and even of angels, but have not loved that reasoning, intentional spirit, devotion, spiritual devotion, such as is inspired by God's love for and in us. I am only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers, the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose, and understand all secret truths and mysteries, and possess all knowledge, and if I have sufficient faith, so that I can remove mountains, but have not love. God's love in me, I am nothing, a useless nobody. Even if I do want all that I have to the poor in providing food, and if I surrender my body to be burned, or in order that I may glory, but have not love, God's love in me, I gain nothing. <clears throat> Love endures long and is impatient and kind. Now, I made the first part of this bold because with each of these translations, 
it starts the verse 4 with either love is or in many cases love endures long as we see in, in the Amplified Bible here so but the part that is in bold is what we read in the New American Standard also in King James love is well love is translates here in the Amplified Bible and the Amplified Bible is a great uh, resource because it really expands upon the Greek definitions uh, so love endures long and is patient and kind love never is envious as I said that wrong love never is envious nor boils over with jealousy <laughs> interesting concept boils over gives you a word picture huh boils over I think of boiling a pot of water what a mess it makes or boiling over something else like tomato soup wow, a real mess <laughs> but love never boils over with jealousy is not boastful or vainglorious does not display itself haughtily is not conceited arrogant and inflated with pride is not rude unmannerly and does not act unbecomingly love God's love in us does not insist on its own rights or its own way for it is not self-seeking and is not touchy or fretful or resentful it takes no account of the evil done to it my oh my oh my we could all build a case there how many times have we been wronged how many times have you know oh, I won't go there <laughs> I'll get through this but I'm sure you can relate it pays no attention to a suffered wrong <laughs> I, I, I pray for a lot of couples a lot of marriages and I've never done a marriage seminar but I, I get a lot of prayer requests about bad spouses and uh, here pays no attention to a suffered wrong it does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness but rejoices when right <clears throat> when right and truth prevail love bears up under anything and everything that comes is ever ready to believe the best of every person its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances and endures everything without weakening Woo. hallelujah let's read it now from my favorite translation mr wiest he says and this is his expanded New Testament translation. And I put his first verse, couple of verses in here too. And if in the language of men I speak, and the languages of angels, but do not have love, Greek word here used for God's love produced in the heart of the yielded saint by the Holy Spirit. You know, that's really key. Did you get that? The yielded, yielded saint. You know, when you're in a car and you're driving down the highway, you come to a yield sign. What does that mean? Give the other person the right away. You have to yield. And that's, it's a choice. And that's, we talked about this, I believe, in my last message on this series, that we need to prosper our soul. That means making a choice to yielding, making a choice to do what's right even though you know it's hard and, and whoever said that Christianity is easy I'm not sure why they said that but because it's not easy uh, his burden is easy and light but walking it out is a challenge and uh, but anyway in the heart of the yielded saint by the Holy Spirit that's the key is letting the Holy Spirit help you a love that impels one to deny himself for the sake of of the loved one I have already become at the present am, I'm sorry I have already become and at present am sounding brass or a clanging cymbal and if I have the gift of uttering uttering divine revelations and know all the mysteries and all the knowledge and had and if I have all the faith so I am able to keep on removing mountains after mountain but in not possessing love, I am nothing. And if I use all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I deliver my body as a martyr in order that I may glory, but do not have love, I am being profited 
in not even one thing. So again, now here's where we start. Love is, and we says it this way, love meekly, or humbly, and patiently bears <clears throat> ill treatment from others. Love is kind, gentle, benign, pervading and penetrating the whole nature, mellowing all which would have been harsh and austere, is not envious, love does not brag, nor does it show itself off, is not ostentatious, does not have an inflated eagle, does not act unbecomingly, does not seek after the things which are its own, is not irritated, provoked, exasperated, aroused to anger, does not take into account the evil which it suffers, does not rejoice at the iniquity, but rejoices with the truth, endures all things, believes all things, hopes all things, bears up under all things, not losing heart nor courage. Here's a more modern translation. I have two of these modern translations here in my notes here. I'll do the message first and then we'll do the living translation. And I'm going to skip down here to uh, where, where it gets bold. I guess I didn't do that on this one. But we'll start in uh, verse 4. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want it doesn't have. I'm sorry. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. I like that's cool. <laughs> a picture in my mind. Love doesn't strut. Doesn't have a swelled head. Doesn't force itself on others. Isn't always me first. Doesn't fly off the handle. Doesn't keep score of the sins of others. Doesn't revel when others grovel takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts on with anything, I'm sorry, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Hallelujah. And now obviously the Message Bible is not the, you know, a really accurate translation, but the concept there is awesome. You know, here's the Amplified by Bible at the end. I must have copied it instead of moving it. I thought I had one other version, I guess not, the New Living Translation, but that, that'll do it there. So praise God. Uh, I want to wrap this up here in the closing here. Let me put this away here. Uh, save, okay, put that away. So we talked about this last week on how to walk in love. We need to really be cognizant here, and this is what God has been showing me. It's amazing how God prepares us for everything. And in all my years of studying the supernatural, how to walk in the supernatural, how to experience the supernatural, enjoy all the blessings of provision and protection that God has, he, he gave me these five keys. Now, if you've been following this ministry, you probably know this by heart. But in a few minutes here, we're just going to do a quick review, close with prayer. But number one, being sensitive. Key number one is sensitivity. Now, in order to be sensitive, you need to sensitize. How do you do that? The same way Jesus did. Prayer, fasting, and self-denial. Something God said to me a few years ago, he said, if you want to do what Jesus did, then do what Jesus did. Amen. Kind of a deep truth there. But you know, when you look at the life of Jesus, lots of time for prayer, self-denial and fasting and fasting doesn't always have to be food you can fast you can fast anything you can fast facebook you can fast television you can fast video games you can fast golfing or fishing you know it's just denying yourself and giving god that extra time but as as important as sensitivity is and again that what is god saying it's going to be by his word you know like we looked at tonight the word so we are we obedient to the love walk? Uh, so whether it's by the word or by the prompting of the spirit. And this is where I really felt like God said we need to spend some time. 
which is why, again, next week, uh, Tuesday night, we're going to have Dr. Mark Verkler teaching us about hearing the voice of God. And, and uh, again, now when you come, if, if he does anything like he's done in the past, when I've heard him in a seminar or here with us a couple times and been as a guest with my, us here on Tuesday nights, have a paper ready because he's going to probably give you an exercise during the program to uh, do some uh, Holy Spirit writing. So we'll see. And I have no idea. He has, a, he has liberty to do whatever he wants. But uh, it is, as important it is in whatever God is saying, and he's going to show you probably how to journal and how to write by the Spirit. But whatever God shows you, you have to come to a place of obedience. And that is doing what he says. Key number three is humility. You and I have to so recognize we haven't arrived. We have so much to learn. And when we take a position of, oh, I've heard that before, you really put yourself into a prideful place. But pride also, I mean, humility also recognizes, you know, the how much we're nothing without God. And it's weakness. And humility is weakness, not that you're weak, but your strength, it comes from Him, that you're strong in His might. And the humility, number four, again, knowledge. And Bible says in Hosea, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And here we're in, in this move of God, unlike anything the world has ever seen. And what's God doing? He's revealing Himself, knowledge. He's showing us, teaching us, helping us through the knowledge of the Word and, and by the Spirit so we can walk in the fullness of His plan for our life. And number five again, motivation. And the motivation of heaven is compassion. And when you have this compassion, what happens is you want to help those people that are hurting. You care about the neighbor that's going to hell. Even the neighbor that hates you. And in one of these upcoming meetings, I'm going to share a story about my neighbor that hated me, but how I conquered him through love. Amazing story, funny story, but we'll come back to that. I thought I might share that tonight, but we're out of time. Now, I want to close with prayer. I'm trusting the presence of God is ministering powerfully to you. And uh, but before I close with prayer, I, I just want to ask you to pray yourself about supporting this ministry. I appreciate the opportunity you're giving me to speak into your life. And I'm, I'm asking people more and more because of the vision that God's given to us to reach the nations of the world and the doors that God's opening to us to the nations of the world to build these training centers. And, and uh, when you hear Dr. Rivers, those of you in Milwaukee, and we're going to record that, by the way, and we're going to make those sessions available to our partners. But when you hear how God has positioned us to go into these nations of the world to develop ministry training centers for the political leaders of the world, changing ideology, a changing, you know, their understanding of the greatness of an, a God that's able to do exceedingly abundantly, taking the leading entrepreneurs of a country, the leading businessmen and others, and discipling them. What an opportunity. Well, all this takes money. And uh, again, you're going to hear more about this from Dr. Rivers when he, when he comes with us here in Milwaukee. And again, I'll be sharing that on YouTube. We're going to be recording all of that. But a great opportunity for you to invest in a ministry that is <laughs> impacting the world. So pray about making a donation. Maybe even right now. You can go online right after the call and uh, just go to davemartinministries.com or livingsupernaturally.com. There's a donate button there and uh, help to make a difference. Or call the office, 800-543-PRAY, that's 7729. Or you can mail a donation into the office uh, at post office box 144. Just think of a gross, <laughs> a gross address. <laughs> I've had it for 30 some years. But... Uh, uh, P.O. Box 144, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, 74013. Thank you again for the privilege of giving me to speak into your life, and thank you for your prayers and support of this ministry. Now let's pray. Father, 
Thank you for each one that's on the call. Thank you for each one that's watching by video, uh, live or by recording. And I pray, Lord God, a blessing over them. I pray, Father God, that they're able to experience more and more of this new dimension. And no, it's not new to you, Father. It's certainly new to me. A greater dimension of your presence of love. Father, even as I've experienced it tonight, Father, it's so glorious. Father, I pray this would be upon them and within them, that everywhere they go, this love just, it just fills them. And I think, Father, it flows out of them. People experience this love that, Father, when they're in the market, when they're at work, whatever, Father, the love would just pour out of people for your glory. Father, meet their every need. Father, I thank you. There's just virtues flowing now, I can feel, and virtues of healing. So, Father, those that need healing tonight, I pray for healing. I pray for deliverance. I pray, Father God, for meeting the needs. You know, Father, exactly where they're hurting. You know the number of hairs that are in their head. You know where they're hurt, where they're hurting, where they have need. Father, thank you for ministering to those needs now and even meeting the desires of their heart for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.